<laughs> Hello everyone, and welcome back down here to the Gamer's Den with me, your host, Jordan, your Master of Lore and Storyteller Extraordinaire. Now, I promise you, the next step in the Witch's Guide series, taking a look at their spells, is coming along. Just... As we go further along, there are more and more interesting spells, and there's a lot of different sources that I like to look through in order to try to find things that uh, uh, may not have always been covered in other guides, or at least to try to give you a different take and different opinion uh, than what some other guides may have had. That said, some things are just naturally going to sync up just because the mechanics are what the mechanics are. It's going to be in the little details and here or there that there may be some disagreements, which I'm sorting out on my end. But for that said, we are continuing on in the DM guide, making better campaigns, and I want to take a look at survival games. Now, survival games are... Well, they just have that survival element to them that may not otherwise quite so often appear in other standard RPG tabletop games. These differ from uh, your straight-up combat scenarios, uh, your adventures of campaigning on a, on a literal military campaign, and they differ a little bit from your cloak and dagger games in that they're not so much focused on subtlety, but what they do have in common is an emphasis more on the player's various skills. Skills that might otherwise not get the same degree of usage, time, or effort spent on them. Now, not every game needs to be focused solely on survival. You can introduce these elements easily into any game, campaign, or narrative that you have going. What's required is that the players are isolated and have a limited amount of resources available to them, forcing them to scrounge and try to come up with different tips, tricks, or ways to survive. Now, with that said, when putting these things together, I have my own tips, tricks, and recommendations for all you various DMs and storytellers out there who may be wanting to try to add something like this into your games. Starting off, one thing you want to do is let the players know what kind of game you're running. Just give them a little bit of an idea beforehand. Well, if it's a campaign already in session, you're throwing a new challenge at them. But if you're starting a new campaign and you're wanting to uh, start with a new group of characters, let the players know what kind of a game it is you're running. As, uh, if it's already a bunch of characters that are currently in progress, you may have a little bit of difficulty divesting them of their equipment and gear without going through some more extreme, extraneous lengths in order to get them in a position where they have to rely more on their skills. That said, if it's players that are already, or characters that are already in progress and have gotten a few levels, they are probably already going to have some skills and some various class abilities that will help them in this, and thus you're going to need to cater and adjust to the players and their skill sets already. But for brand new players, let them know the kind of game you're running, and then limit their starting gear, as you want them to scrounge, scrape, and scrap together, and bring together everything they can, based off of their individual skill sets, as well as their class abilities. How much you do just really depends on how extreme and the type of game that you're running. Uh, and in particular, you're also going to want to brush up on rules for starvation, thirst, and exposure, just to add an element of uncertainty and uh, an extra level of danger and something the players have to be aware of. As normally, I don't really make, I, for myself, I don't make my players keep track of how often they eat, how often they drink. It's generally assumed that they are digging into their rations, and they're usually pretty good about letting me know once in a while when they camp or go to town or head back to their homes that they are taking time, you know, to take care of themselves, you know, tend to wounds, clean up, eat, uh, all the general grooming and self-care sort of stuff that you'd want to do. But these rules will be absolutely helpful in establishing the tone and the kind of setting that you're throwing the players into. Really, really good to brush up on these, no matter what the game. Most games should have this in there. And if they don't, well, you may need to adapt them from other tabletop games or create them from scratch yourself, if you're willing to go the distance on that. In particular, also, as the players are going along and gathering things together, you're going to want to really tailor the opportunities for loot and tailor the loot to the characters depending on the classes that are available. Um, 
the reason for that being it is a survival game. You don't want to give them an overabundance of loot, uh, uh, of equipment, of different kinds of gear, things that are going to make their lives radically easier surviving out in the wilds or the in the post-apocalyptic world or whatever kind of survival setting you may have them in. Give them some gear, give them some equipment, but don't give them so much that their lives are immediately dramatically easier. A few bits of equipment here and there can make a world of difference for players without breaking the need for them to make better use of their skills and for them to be creative in how they implement things and the extreme lengths that they may be going to try to survive in the world you've put before them. But those opportunities for loot may require combat or theft on the part of the players. In either case, it's going to leave a trail for potential foes to track the players. Depending on what the situation is, um, Z Bashu has a wonderful video about just such a survival setting that uh, the players were essentially pr convicts escaped from a prison and they're taking off and they're running through the snowy mountains, through the woods that populate the mountainside, and they're being pursued by a warden, several jailers, uh, guard dogs. They're being tracked down and they are le they're leaving a little, they're trying to minimize the trail they leave, but. If you're doing something similar where they have an opponent going after them, whatever the opponent may be, any combat they get into, one, it d could yield some potentially really helpful loot, but at the same time, it puts uh, players at risk for injury and straining resources that they, uh, that they don't have until the combat happens. And then, you know, if they're getting medical supplies uh, as part of this combat, and they're injured well some of those medical supplies are going to get used up thus diminishing the quality uh and that well not the value of the reward but it still diminishes how much of a reward they're getting because they're immediately having to spend it and theft well if they're stealing from people other travelers trappers whoever may be living on the mountainside or other survivors and they have opponents tracking them and they, the, their opponents end up talking to whoever it is they've stolen from, that can be a pretty good indicator and a reasonable uh, it, uh, thing for you to use as justification for these guys to be tracking the players. So it's something the opportunities for loot, combat, or theft should make the players calculate the risk. How big of a trail are they leaving? Can they sneak off with just a few items and hope that they're, uh, the people they're stealing from don't notice? Or can they minimize the, uh, the level of combat so that uh, they don't leave as big a trail or it's not as readily noticeable a trail? And then also, this kind of comes back to again to the setting that I described that uh, Zbashu has a video on, which I'll leave a link in the description below so you guys can go and check it out. But for fantasy settings, you're going to want a house rule that most spell components are consumed by spell casting. Uh, there's plenty in dis in different spell descriptions that are, but in particular, one again that Z brings up is Goodberry. Goodberry uh, requires in fifth edition. Um, a sprig of mistletoe. It does not explicitly state that the mistletoe is consumed in the casting of the Goodberry spell. And what Goodberry does, at least in 5th edition, is it creates 10 berries that can provide enough nourishment for a full 24 hours to each character that eats one. Um, it also report, provides one point of healing and helps them in a couple other ways. But it's the biggest thing is that it's a minor source of healing that can help keep them alive. And it's something that, you know, party of four players, one casting a good berry, they have two and a half days. Uh, well, at least two of the players will have three days of food and the other two will have two. But if that spell is not, or if that component is not consumed when they cast it, they can just keep casting and casting for however many spell slots they have and negate a great deal of the difficulty for the survival setting. So, house rule ahead of time that uh, a lot of spells like this will consume the spell components. Most players, especially if they have an idea beforehand what their characters are getting into, 
will not have a problem with this. And third edition, Goodberry is, well, it's even worse for this kind of a setting. It only makes 2d4, so there's a bit of randomness, but the berries will last one day per caster level. So a level four druid can cast this at least once each day and continuously have handfuls of berries that are going to last for up to four days. That absolutely will break a lot of the difficulty for a survival styled game. Now, another thing you should do, and I've made mention of this a little bit here before, but emphasize the usefulness of crafting and knowledge skills. Your players should already have that idea in their heads, but let them know and definitely emphasize and let them go about crafting and using their knowledge skills in order to survive. Knowledge skills to help identify various plants, animals, useful roots, herbs, what's edible, what's poisonous, what animals are located in the area that they can make use of. And you can even use these knowledge skills in conjunction with the survival skill in order to help them build some temporary shelters, give them a little bit of cover from the horrific effects of weather out there so that they lessen the amount of exposure they're getting to those extreme extremes in weather. And hell, with survival in particular, they can track down various animals, hunt down those animals, and this style of setting will actually get you using a lot of different kinds of animals and creatures that normally don't get used all that much in a lot of these in different tabletop games and again that's more opportunity for them to use crafting skills to harvest meat and hides make use of the bones and sinews gather uh, appropriate kinds of sticks from trees made of the right kind of wood to make arrows and spears and staves all kinds of things but the other drawback to this is making their own gear and utilizing these skills does take time and necessitates that they are localized to one area for at least a little while. And that leaves a bit more of a trail, more signs that there were people in the spot where they're camping, which again leads back to potential foes tracking them down. Maybe somebody they stole from before is pissed off, has gathered off some, gathered up some of their friends, and are now hunting down the people that, that they believe stole from them. Honestly, lots of interesting opportunities for you to throw at the players as they go about this. Now, one other thing it's, that's important to mention here with this kind of game, this style of game, this kind of uh, setting, is going to force your players to be a bit more creative with the different kinds of skills and how they use their skills. Let them. That's absolutely what you want. You want them to get creative. Now, you can't let them, say, take a, a lighter, a little bit of sheet metal, a rubber band, and a steering wheel and make a bulldozer. That's just stupid. They can't MacGyver things together quite that well. But let them, let them be MacGyvers. Let them put together different tools. You can give them different, uh, different degrees of penalties for you know, using makeshift tools. But if they're doing really well on their craft checks and they get a really cool idea that eh, seems close enough, then yeah, let them get something decent out of their crafting skills. Like, uh, like wizards, for example. Wizards will require a fair bit of consideration for this kind of game if you're running this in a fantasy-oriented uh, setting. Because wizards need spell books, they need their familiars, typically having a staff doesn't hurt them either. It's just kind of classic part of the wizard's re repertoire. You know, let them scrounge together different ways of making uh, books and scribing in new spells or even working to enchant certain things. If Even if, say, they don't have the... Uh, necessarily the prerequisite spells that they need to get everything uh, that they want made. If they're taking some time each day and they say, hey, I haven't used up my cantrips, so I'm going to use my spell slots to create some minor enchantments, some minor trinkets. We have time, we're camping here, we have a little bit of shelter, a place where I can focus and, rel and rest and put my mind to task here. So for the next couple of days each night, I'm going to pour some spell energy into creating some of these minor trinkets well you know what let them do that it's not technically by a lot of the rules for magic item creation but if they take that magic 
a magic item creation feat uh, to create just some different little trinkets, but they don't have necessarily all the spells or spell components just make it take a little bit longer a little bit more effort because they're having to finagle it and you can even put in a, a percentage failure chance for some of these different items just to help level things out there but it'll make the play it'll be a way to reward the players and make the flip players feel pretty cool pretty clever for coming up with this kind of an idea or solution absolutely something you really really want to do don't uh, don't penalize your players and don't block them at every turn from trying a neat idea work with them on it roll with it and just see what happens you know again put in some failure chances put in some put in a percentage chance that the the item that they make isn't going to work it's so that way they have something that can be useful but it's not going to be useful every time and say it's an item with a num limited number of uses like three uses today they have a a minor decanter of water creation it's not going to give them a full steady stream but you know what um they can use it three times per day it has a 30 percent failure chance and it can produce enough water for two people to survive uh, f survive off of absolutely something you could do it's useful it takes some of the burden off of uh, relying so much on their survival skills but it's not something they can just depend on and constantly use and reuse they have to think about what they're doing they have to plan it out and hope that the dice favor them as you know they may if they just keep rolling and use up their charges for the day and they've gotten three failures in a row well you know they they can't depend on that item or maybe they only get enough water for half the party so really again some interesting options there and that brings me to another point you are going to want to track their resources very very closely and not just equipment and but uh, as far as tracking resources goes that will depend very much so on the kind of game that you are making them survive in is it a post-apocalyptic scenario has the zombie apocalypse arrived or are they prisoners on the run or are they shipwrecked and just floating out at sea somewhere with the bits of flotsam that have uh, just managed to stay above on the uh on top of the waves at the ocean or are they stranded on a desert island trying to just make it by and going all robinson robinson crusoe on everything but that'll be a video for next time next time around i want to take a look at a very specific kind of survival game it's one that many gamers are tired of seeing pop up or at least were tired for a while there and that is zombies i love zombie survival games and i love running them in d20 modern and i've been putting together a just on the side a little bit of a scenario and a setting with some different rules tips tricks and ideas for running that kind of a set a survival setting for your players and i'll be more than happy to share that here with you all at the gamers den but with that said i've been your host jordan your master of lore and your storyteller extraordinaire if you like today's video well then why not go down there and click on that like button and if you've got some feedback for me, good, bad, or indifferent, just drop it down there in the comment section be uh, below. I'd love to know what I'm doing right, what just doesn't really float your boat, and also I want to know what is actually just yanking you out of being entertained here by me. Please let me know, and even click the dislikes down there. But if you've been enjoying content here, well, hell, why not consider joining us regular as... Uh, as a member down here at the Gamers Den, we'll be more than happy to have you, and having more people jumping in on the, the discussion only enriches us all. But again, I'm Jordan, your, your host, Master of Lore, and Storyteller Extraordinaire. You guys have yourselves a good night.